All right, can you hear me? Good morning, everybody. If we could be seated and uh, get a little bit of hush, please. All right, well, uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to, uh, by my count, day five out of six of our six-day festival of aeronomy. <sighs> Uh, I, this is my first um, large in-person meeting since COVID, and I have to say it is just fantastic to be back and to see everybody and to see the energy and hear the talks and experience the expertise that's in this community. It is really uh, invigorating and exciting, and I think we're going to continue that with a, an excellent program this morning. We have a one distinguished lecture uh, from Mike Taylor and then two talks on DEI for our morning session. Uh, so I think... Without further ado, I will ask uh, Jens Oberheide to come up and introduce our distinguished lecture speaker, Mike Taylor. I'm very much looking forward to Mike's talk and I'm very excited by this. Thank you, Jens. Good morning, uh, everybody. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, our distinguished lecturer uh, this year, Professor Mike Taylor of uh, Utah State uh, University. So as uh, most of uh, you know, and uh, so I'm only saying that more for, for the students, the Distinguished Lecturer is the highest award CEDAR can uh, award. We are a poor community, so that means our highest award is actually ask someone to give a talk to work for us, right? That's, uh, but uh, uh, so we are very glad that uh, Mike is going to do that. And so Mike receives this award uh, for his uh, pioneering work on optical remote sensing of uh, Earth's air glow from the ground, from the air, and from space. So let me uh, say a few words uh, about uh, Mike's background. Mike is from England, so nobody is perfect, right? <laughs> <laughs> so he got his uh, PhD in atmospheric uh, physics uh, from Southampton University in uh, 1986. He then moved uh, to Logan in uh, Utah in 91, if uh, I counted correctly, first as a research appointment at the Space Dynamics Lab, and then later on as a tenured full professor uh, at uh, Utah State uh, University. And as a professor, Mike uh, really likes uh, to teach. That's why we do that as uh, faculty uh, members. Mike has advised uh, over uh, 15 graduate students and uh, uncounted undergrads introducing them to our profession and to, to our field. And actually, I must say, I don't really recall being at the CEDA meeting since I was a grad student uh, many, many years ago without Mike really being there and sharing his excitement uh, being an aeronomer and uh, really being an uh, inspiration for, uh, for me and I'm certain for, for most of us. So scientifically, I think uh, without Mike, we wouldn't really know what we know today in our community about uh, gravity wave uh, dynamics and uh, vertical wave coupling. So Mike wrote over 200 publications about uh, small scale wave dynamics, uh, observations of the air glow. They have been cited almost 10,000 times. So I think that clearly shows the impact. But I only want to, to highlight uh, one uh, particular uh, paper uh, Mike wrote uh, over 30 years ago. And that's because at CEDA, we talk a lot about uh, vertical wave coupling and uh, about uh, dynamics, how the lower atmosphere drives uh, the upper atmosphere. And Mike, uh, together with uh, Hapgood in 1988, uh, wrote a truly groundbreaking paper that kind of paved the way of how the lower atmosphere drives upper atmosphere variability. So about the thunderstorms as a source of gravity waves uh, in uh, the air glow. So Mike, Mike has uh, also made many other first discoveries uh, throughout his career in traveling the world and uh, pointing the com uh, his camera upwards uh, into the sky. So, and uh, I can't really uh, list them all here because I don't want to eat too much into Mike's uh, uh, lecture time here, but only to, to uh, mention two, that's quantifying gravity wave occurrences, uh, occurrence frequencies, and uh, the role of gravity waves in uh, bubble seeding and uh, for, for spread F. And so Mike will continue to serve our communi community uh, as the uh, principal investigator of the OR mission, which is about to be launched uh, to the International Space Station uh, later this year. 
and from which uh, we as a CEDA community can uh, really expect an amazing new view of how the lower atmosphere is uh, driving uh, upper atmosphere variability. So Mike, we are very much looking forward to your distinguished lecture and what one can actually do when traveling the world and pointing a camera upwards into the sky. That was a good couple of minutes used up, but I really enjoyed them. I've never been in this position before, and I want to seriously thank everybody in the, here and the committee for all of their support through the years. I've uh, been coming to CEDA meetings, nearly all of them, and have so much support and activity together. So let's not uh, use this time up too much. I've got a lot to show, actually, and I hope hope you enjoy it. So, let's go on. Okay, Jens referred to groundbreaking research, but um, I started off my career finishing finishing uh, being a student at Southampton University in Britain, and uh, I was uh, a bit of a loss for a job. I did have jobs, but I didn't want them. I wanted something exciting, and. Lo and behold, I was leaving the department, physics department, on the Friday afternoon, feeling a little low. And uh, I saw this little label, uh, advertising opportunities for students to get, become involved in space research. And, uh, well, I lit up on that. Ran upstairs to the room of the lecturer who I hadn't met before, Pam Rothwell, who used to be our mentor for the rest of her career. But... Um, we talked and chatted, and she basically hired me on the spot, or at least legally. And um, that's how I became involved with space physics, or and it involved using a television camera, which came along uh, out of the blue. Pam was very good at uh, negotiating, and uh, although we were I was actually initially making sound parts for sounding rockets. So uh, that got superposed by the potential to use a camera, a very sensitive camera, which was being made available by a hospital in London. They use those cameras for basically uh, body scanners and you don't want to kill the patient. And, uh, but um, those cameras got more safely and they had them as they became available to us and we started using these low light capable cameras to look at the sky at night and that's when you discovered the gravity waves and all of the features uh, other emissions it opens up the door so that's yeah ah good so that's a bit of a monster there that's our isocon camera that's one of the ones that was given to us there's a small one to the right which is a another version of it. But we would carry that uh, on trains, buses, planes, you name it. We lost it in Japan uh, at the airport. And they're all, it's done a lot of traveling. We, that's hence our, our title, you know. Uh, we can go anywhere you want as long as we can get there. Next slide. And look at that. This is a beautiful Matterhorn in Switzerland. We were there with that camera. Let's go to the next slide. And this is referring to some of the what, what Jens referred to was that um, on one day there with Mike Papke, my colleague, and uh, we could see this bright region on the horizon. And uh, excuse me, and, it, and immediately think it's due to clouds. But uh, what was keeping them lit, especially as you're getting more into twilight, it should be getting fainter. But it just kept getting brighter and brighter. And then we realized uh, the next day, we'd seen so much here, we'd seen a bright night, which is uh, bright nights are uh, occasions when the air glow emissions get much brighter. And uh, that's what one of these are. And you see the picture on the bottom left, you see structure in it. There are structures due to gravity waves passing through this bright light, uh, like cloud layer, not cloud, but uh, air glow layer. And, um, on the top right, you can see the a mapping of those. 
and it showed that it was actually related with a thunderstorm over France, several hundred kilometers away. So we were seeing there gravity waves in action, energy transport, and getting all of that information uh, to be able to make those conclusions. And that's, uh, let's go to the next slide. And that's uh, emphasized here, which just the uh, parts of cone cartoons. Uh, this one's from Colin Hines and um, you can see, and, oh yeah. Uh, it's just showing the propagation of gravity waves from their sources, as Joan showed there, Joan Alexander, propagating upwards through the troposphere and always being generated into the mesopause region. And essentially all of the things we, pro we preach and talk about today with the students, this is the way that energy can go up. And, uh, and the box on the bottom right there shows what really, uh, we still don't know how much mass uh, energy is going up there and what are its controlling factors and bright nights, are they of any importance? And if not, you know, the door is still wide open for these things. Okay, so this, uh, shows now some of the sources not all of them but just indicating the sources that uh, uh, we can expect we can expect to encounter when we go to interesting sites where they're being made and this is one interesting obviously couldn't pack up and go and chase a, a tongan volcano erupting we had to think of that from afar but Maybe in the future, we should make it so that we can go and do these things. So you really can see gravity waves of the similar scale sizes that you get from weather disturbances from these other major disturbances. Next slide. So what are we measuring? Uh, essentially, I've said it's the air glow emission. If you, uh, with your astronaut glasses on, you can see that green glowing layer. That is, uh, completely surrounds the Earth. It's a natural phenomena. And it, um, sorry about my throat here. Um, you can see it glowing uh, at night. And uh, basically this is the layer that as the gravity waves propagate up through, you can see their structures as they go up through that. Go to the next one. On the right hand side, I've superposed some red line emissions. I'm not going to dwell on this, but the important point is there are several air glow layers completely surrounding the Earth, and they have different altitudes and brightnesses, but they're all going to be affected by gravity waves as, as they propagate through these layers. So we have a way of uh, uh, basically testing things. Let's go another step further. Now I'm going to be out of breath. <laughs> Uh, no, a step further in, uh, in terms of our mobility. Uh, I didn't say, but that image of those, those curved waves, uh, they really got around the world in terms of uh, being very important for influencing uh, progress in this. And here's an example where uh, Doran Baker in, in uh, Utah State, uh, he saw our presentation and invited us to come to uh, Utah to basic to uh, take our cameras there, set it up, and we'll drive anywhere and uh, set up and uh, take some data. You know, we we got it, and that's what we did. That uh, trailer there on the left, uh, on the right, you can see some gravity waves um, seen by a camera with a fairly narrow field of view. Think of it um, uh, as a snap, it snaps up on the sky. But um, any gravity waves in that box, we could see them in the camera, that's the bright part. But we don't have any way of measuring its temperature or anything like that. But with this, what Doran gave us was an interferometer, a field widened Michelson interferometer, very sensitive and built by Alan Steed at Utah State. But that instrument is the one that's sitting there pointing upwards. It was actually by the side of that. Oh, I should use this. I shouldn't. Basically, rotate that round 90 so that it points out of the towards us. And uh, here's a telescope that's attached to it with the camera. So we had the camera bore sighted uh, with the interferometer. They're both looking in the same direction. 
So we're getting temperatures and we're getting brightness values and structure. So that's a great piece of data. This and that uh, was uh, another great success for us to be able to now then determine or calculate what the temperature perturbations actually were. And I haven't shown it here that's just for you to find out, but it's it's, very, it's really quite significant, and it will drive the ones that um, we'll show you later in this talk. Okay. So armed with that, we're we're really doing very well with these instruments. It's still the old ones, uh, but uh, we learned that the, the, the building new CCD cameras for other reasons. And uh, we borrowed one from Photometrics. And uh, this is this is at uh, Arecibo during the 10 day run. Yes. But essentially uh, we were able to use the cameras, these, these ones, uh, to get more data that we could quantify with, because our camera is from the hospital is not the wasn't the best in the world, but it was doing well. Here we go. So this is a camera. So we wanted to be more sophisticated. So we had a filter wheel with a camera. It's rotating around and takes pictures of the green line, the sodium line, the OH line layer. It does that continuously rotating around during the night. So you get measurements. Uh, but what we get in this camera is because these air glow layers occur at different altitudes, and OH layers at different altitude to a green line layer by several kilometers. So we get information on the altitude variation and the temperature perturbations. So we've got all that extra information there just by running this new camera there. And I said, uh, so that was a system that uh, we tested it on the roof in, here in the US. And also uh, then deployed it uh, uh, to Antarctica. Let's go to the next slide. So here we go. This is showing what the camera can do. That's about three, hour, three hours worth of data, I think. But it's showing you now this all sky image. It's showing you gravity waves rotating across the sky. Uh, you can see these as bright nights sometimes. But we'll talk about those one day. But most of the time, whenever we look up at the sky with these cameras, it's full of gravity waves, totally rich. In fact, and it gets to the point where you then start getting events which you'd never even thought about. This is one. Where uh, I think it's a well, what, doesn't matter, but it, I think it's on the weekend time, so we weren't all studying it. But essentially, uh, what we had was uh, was one camera and more filters on the filter wheel. So we're getting a picture here and another one here of a, di of a different emission. So what we could see was that. Um, one looks like one wave was moving one direction and the other one the opposite direction but it's really the same wave so we had this sort of a wave, wave crest here and this one here but these would be coming down this way and the other ones would be perpendicular to it so that was um eventually determined by uh ed duan at the air force and he said it's a, definitely a bore. Now, bores are events that are well known if you sort of looking at it on lakes and things like that, and rivers, I should say. Sorry, not lakes. <laughs> anyway, they uh, became uh, to be very high contrast, and as you can see, measuring that this is, gives you the t temperature perturbations of one of those emissions. And the other one gives the other one. So that's really, uh, it became famous for its uh, strangeness. And uh, so I got nicknamed as the Taylor Bore. So, <laughs> we're supposed to laugh at that, don't we? Not too much. <laughs> anyway, well, now, now we're going into, we've got a camera. It's where we want it to be. We can let it roll and take data, analyze the data. I said, this is, oh, now we're in Brazil. And uh, 
There were nice facilities there and we left the camera there for a couple of years and we got some great data there. And uh, basically we can build up uh, these uh, information for different sites and times and compare them. Are the, the bores or are the ways you see in Brazil the same ones you saw at Arecibo or in Antarctica and things like that? What are the sources? Well, we know we think we know what the sources are. Do they show the same signature? Next one, please. Oh, a little bit of R and R. We'll put this one um, just to break it up a bit. But essentially, yeah, when you go on these field campaigns, uh, we've done several of them, lots of them. Dominique's done tons, and um, we have the capability now to make these measurements, I just want to say, everywhere. Next slide. And here we can see an event. So uh, once again, these things just pop up and go across the screen and uh, not bad. And then you get some other ones which are really uh, important ones in terms of their, we measure their brightness variations. And by doing that, we can infer the temperature and intensity of the impact on the, on the mesosphere region. Region. Uh, yeah, you go to nice places and you also come out of them as well. So, this is a nice shot here. Uh, I was on this ship, uh, Shackleton, and um, spent some time at Halley. And um, we got there to get from wonderful data from there as well. So, uh, well, we're happy we've got all this good stuff. But are we really happy? Because we haven't got any information on the temperature or the brightness uh, that's quantified. So we talked with Bill Pendleton at Utah State and came up with a camera design where we would actually use well-known techniques that we could integrate into the camera. Uh, and uh, giving us a way to calculate the temperature of them. Let's, so let's just roll through this. So that camera was made, oh, hang on a second. That camera was made um, with a grant, specifically a CEDA grant uh, to kick off the new millennium, uh, get everybody to put in proposals. Um, we, what new instruments do we need for the future? And that um, was funded and worked well and calibrated. And so that's all the information you need when you look at it. Let's look at the next slide. And here, what you basically it's a, uh, you're looking at the emission lines from uh, the, the brightness of the emission lines and uh, taking ratios of them. And that's well developed uh, uh, method. John Merriweather has made uh, that very clear. And um, so this camera now then can give us temperature and intensity as well as all the other stuff. So this is getting to be really good. And you can see it's a simple relationship that we we bring together to do that next slide and just showing down here so we've got the same same wave events seen at, seen at different wavelengths looking at the perturbations taking the ratios and coming back with the temperature perturbations and there are different you can make different ratios from different uh, mixing so that's very capable. So we've got now this advanced, well, the, that temperature mapper there, uh, uh, the, a, the AMTM, and we've had that on the roof at Starfire and with Chet Gardner and Gary, and basically that's down in the uh, Air Force in Maui and in Andy's LiDAR Observatory where we have a system uh, with, a, with a radar, with a LIDAR sort of there as well. So now we're bringing these instruments together at different facilities. So we're getting even more capability. So SEED is growing in its capability uh, and dealing with, um, uh, well, just it creates a, a center of excellence. Next. This is some, uh, an example where, um, we have two, the same event, but seen by two cameras from two different places. So uh, Steve Smith has a system uh, giving you the, the large field of view. Sorry, I think I was pressing the button too long. 
Oh, there it is. Yeah. So we have one small field of view in color. That, that's our camera because we had intensity and temperature. And here's the field of view of, of the other, other camera. And Carlos Martinez is involved in this too. And we superpose those. And I, I wanted to put that up to remind that um, that's another parameter that you have available. You can uh, zoom in and get higher resolution. And I know that uh, um, plenty of people, Dave Fritz loves very, very small scale waves. And uh, you can superpose them and scale this, sort of zoom in on them. Next one. Uh, so, we haven't given up yet on what you can still do with these cameras. And we're calling this one the advanced mesospheric temperature mapper. And what's the advanced bit about it? Well, in the time since we last bought a camera, the capabilities of uh, some of the ones in the in gas ones in the infrared are really important because they have intensity brightness at least 70 times that of the current camera we have, just because we're looking at a different OH emission. So it gives us more signal. So we've got stronger signal. We have uh, talked with SDL and said, go and that's the Space Dynamics Lab. And we have this support. It's actually from the Air Force to build this one. And uh, this, this is 10 feet long. 10 feet long is like a bazooka. In fact, a big one. And um, here it is set up in, in the cat in, uh, this is in Antarctica. We have it in ro several places, I want to say. Yeah, and here's our ratio method. Um, looking at the emissions, two different emission lines in the background, always check in the background. And you then get a temperature plot, intensity plot, take the ratio, you've got your momentum flux. Okay, and here's a plot of momentum flux. Well, not, that's not a momentum flux. But anyway, it shows the variability and the quality of the data. Because we, the other thing you can, with a higher signal, we can take them at a much um, quicker resolution. And um, that's what's showing here. That's actually an image. This is called a keogram, where you take us an image and take a slice down the middle and stack it up, then put another one down the middle of the next one and stick it up. So you end up with a lot of information of how the event is uh, proceeding. And so we have a lot of data in these, in these keograms. And basically, you, you, this gives you a measure of joy. studies during the course of the night, it's getting brighter, fainter, and what other structures might be in there. We, we, you can see some of these, you might show, if a ball passed through it, you'd see a sharp line here in, in that data. We have plenty of those. So it's a good way of uh, archiving it. This is now looking at raw data. It's been flat fielded, but nevertheless, you can see, just watch this, you see this? So you'll see in a wave pattern, which is very smooth when it first came into the field of view, breaking up completely. Oh, oh, you're doing it again, good. See them there now? Oh, and here's the temperature. So we, have a so we have a temperature map now as well. Here you can see those features breaking down. So now, it's, it's, instead of it being, a, we think they break up when they get big enough, and where do they come from? And when you get an image, it gives you more insight into the, into the data. And when it happened, how big a field of view did it happen? If we had a bigger camera with a bigger field of view, we could uh, make even more maps. And okay, so there, here we are, no, no boundaries for us. We're at South Pole, and uh, some some items shouldn't be there, of course. <laughs> he got lost. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. don't dwell on that. And maybe these guys got lost as well. 
And a couple of students we found down there from Utah State didn't know that, but it was very nice to meet up with them and talk with them, and they helped us. So we have run instruments at South Pole for how much is it, Dominique? 10 years? More than 10 years. Well, thanks, Yu Chen. Yeah. And this is the sort of data you get because uh, if you get a nice clear night, uh, you can get 24 hours and it can go to the next night, another 24 hours. Just keep the data rolling. And uh, there's a lot of analyses been done then on not just gravity waves with periods of uh, 20 minutes or 10 minutes or 12, small, small periods. Here now we know when we do spectral analyses of them, you've got um, diurnals, semi-diurnal, eight-hour wave. It's all popping up in the data. And that's just, and they're so rich because these, I want to say this noise up and down like that is not noise, that's data. When we look at it in carefully, the waves we see in here of a broad range of spectrums are being pulled out by the analysis here. So that's a, bit, a beautiful data, set of data for long periods, um, gravity wave studies, or tides. Here's a, another example here. Um, this one's basically, it's South Pole again, but um, now looking at a, a different event and you see we're pulling out a different periodicity. And so sharp, it, you know, this is just data waiting to be had. And uh, if you're interested, come and see us. Next one, okay. Well, I think I've been non-stop going, I don't believe it. Right. Oh, a bit more. Okay. Yeah. So we will obviously go to a conference and things like that, and people come up to us saying, yeah, we'd like to put, put a camera here or do that or buy one. And so we, we have a lot of people in the community that want to do that. So they have what we've done. And so we created a uh, with, with with colleagues uh, our Angwin Antarctic Gravity Wave Instrument Network, uh, where you put your camera at your facility, Rothera, Halley, South Pole, any, anywhere where you can have access to it. And the thing is that access, which costs uh, is impossible to believe you could actually utilize that or run that something like that, but those facilities exist already, they're all available. So yeah, they, people get the camera, put it in, and we have, can have campaigns that we, they're taking data all the time. So we end up with this very rich uh, program uh, giving data all the way around Antarctica. And that data, and so we can now study variability or other, other possibilities. Next one. And Anguin's been going on for a few years now. And we have, this is the Anguin, all of this is the Anguin workshops, but at different times. So different, different years. So now we're getting Anguin data, uh, which has got a history. And uh, people like to come to Anguin meetings because we are all focused. And mm -hmm. did I point at someone? Is all right? Okay, all right. So I don't know where the next meeting is going to be, but um, it'll be soon. And this one uh, is an example of the ang Anguin uh, data analyses uh, using different uh, capabilities. Uh, Takuji Nakamura's group in Japan have developed a way of analyzing these data more easily because otherwise the data is too cumbersome. And uh, we, we have also uh, built on that. And you can see here's an event where I mean, this is happening all the time. And you're just seeing the gravity wave activity, mainly this side and then this side and then nothing here. But you get um, knowledge on what's happening. Um, so, okay. So now let's have some more fun. We've been on the ground uh, long enough. And here we are with uh, Dave Fritz and uh, all of our colleagues. 
uh, on the NASA, the NSC, the G5 aircraft. And on this project, it was called, um, was a, it's just, just a few years ago. And we flew our temperature mapper on the, here, there's Dominique here. I'm somewhere there, but um, so the temperature mapper pointing up through the aeroplane and also sideways. We also flew some two low elevation uh, windows, so we had cameras, alert, so we'd actually get more information, not only in the zenith, but also as you look at away from the plane. So I'll show you some of that too. And uh, everything's set up nicely there. So here's a plot, Dominique makes brilliant data uh, plots. Um, this is the zenith one, and you can see uh, Auckland, uh, Auckland Islands there. As the plane flies along and then turns, the pilot's told to turn to the left or right, it paints the sky. So we wanted to see with the Auckland Islands, uh, were there any waves? It's only 600 meters tall. And the bet was on that they wouldn't show any waves because those 600 meter uh, out of mountains wouldn't be worth a dime. But when you start to do this, you see what these incredible fight outs where you see these waves, which are clear, clearly related to the ones. So these are in the, uh, the tropical altitude. And these are uh, in the above the altitude in the OH layer. Does that make sense? Yeah. And that's where the camera was located. This is another one we had located on the land because uh, the story goes here is that uh, the bet was on that um, we didn't have, uh, it'll be wasting uh, a flight because there wouldn't be any decent signature. But as I've shown you, what we saw was one of the biggest uh, events yet. And uh, that's what we're showing next. So this is from a camera there, so it's fixed on the ground and the plane flies over it. So, so this is the temperature data. Can you see this? Is rolling, twisting, breaking. Sort of thing. But uh, we know where it's all related to. You can see all these things twirling. Uh, twirling sounds a bit weak. But essentially, high resolution information on breaking events. And you can hit, now here we're calculating some of the parameters. And we can calculate the momentum flux. And uh, here we have a, a plot of it, because this event had a very sharp sort of trough in it. And we can sit on the ground, we are sitting there and basically seeing this thing growing and growing and breaking. And uh, that's being shown here with the large um, values every now and then, but uh, just twisting itself up and then letting go. And I showed it, the value there is 300 meters squared per second, per second set. Oh, my, oh my. I need to go backwards, I've got a lot of time. Okay, I'm on fire. Okay. Let's talk about ore. Now, ore, atmospheric waves experiment, is a child who is born out of the, all of this data we're seeing wherever you go. So let's get a way we can measure that and do that obviously with a satellite. And so when the opportunity came to bid to do uh, measurements using the space station, it became available. 
and we wrote a proposal, a beautiful proposal that went in. And Jeff and, and Dave and some of the big guys. But really, really, it was a, a perfect proposal as far as I'm concerned, because it hit all the spots and showed you what you needed. And the reviewers liked it. And we've been taken now to the point through good weathers and bad weathers and things like that. But uh, we're now looking to launch this instrument in November of this year. So this is a warning or a waving that we'll be able to oh, show you. Oh, we'll talk about that in a minute. So here's some of the SDL guys, very dedicated, some of the instrumentation there. And uh, I spent five years working with them, just learning what went into the instrument. Uh, and how to do it, they're, they're a marvelous team. Okay. So now this is more like, just look at, let's, let's just look at some of the data. I think uh, Jess showed some of this um, a little while back. But essentially, you're in orbit, it's, it's, the, it's the ISS orbit. So you've got that, uh, that's fixed. And we have ways then also, so this ISS will be going around and taking a map uh, every 50 minutes or so, and it's just keeping going, and we're going to have that running all the time uh, for nighttime measurements only. But um, essentially, we get, we'll map out these regions. I've just put the information there many times during the day, or during the day, I shouldn't say that, during the night. And that uh, we had proposed as a two-year mission, and that's what we're anticipating. So I said, November this year, two-year mission, and you're sitting on the ground or in your airplane or whatever, we have the opportunity to do coordinated, calibrated joint measurements. And so let's not waste this opportunity and uh, say, well, don't, don't want to do that because it's going to be a, a long time before something comes along that can be done so, so quickly. There are other, obviously, missions, that, excuse me, from NASA, dynamics and things like that. But um, this is uh, ready. Next one. Oh, good. So we've been busy. We, uh, that we're putting in here, it's just giving you information. I hadn't uh, appreciated quite how much uh, busy we've been. I should point over here. I apologize for not moving around. But um, essentially, uh, we've been very, I want to say very active, but I want to re will remain so. And we'll do that by new students, offering new opportunities, uh, all those Antarctic stations, uh, all measurements now. And where we have other cameras and cameras from other people that are synchronized like ours, uh, take the same sort of data. So it makes it easier to analyze the data. So we feel we're, we're ready to tackle the, the data burst that we're gonna get. And um, started off with, you know, all around the world. That sort of sounds a bit sort of weird. But you can see we've just marked out sites where there currently or have been measurements of great significance. And that's before all is in orbit. And then all is going to paint in all this is all of this region between 54 degrees. All of it, I should join this way. Yeah, so, yeah. Next one. Anyone got any ideas? Oh, and here's a, here's all the people that do all the work. And uh, students love just love love the programs because it gives them something to do. It's very meaningful. I don't know whether to stop there now.
No questions, right? I can't imagine. Okay, well, thanks, Mike, for that fantastic talk. I really, I really enjoyed that. And one thing it reminded me of, I remember years ago, there was a conference up in Alaska where we had a bunch of modelers come up to talk about the Aurora and they did a trip out to Poker Flat and saw the Aurora. And the comment that we got after that was from the modelers, they said, you know, if we'd have actually seen what this stuff looks like, we wouldn't even try to model it. And, <laughs> and somehow when I see your movies of the gravity waves, you know, yeah. it feels the same way. They're just so rich and complicated that yeah. uh, I guess there are better modelers these days. But anyway, um, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed all the Oh, the history awesome. and, the, and the movies and the phenomenon. So we have a little bit of time for questions from the audience. So if there are any questions. Oh. Thank you so much, Mike, for the really fantastic presentation. I saw one of the things on the very ending slide where you said projects not not associated, but work that you've done and you mentioned meteors. Are you able to see with your cameras the impact of, of uh, meteors coming into the atmosphere? Can you actually uh, attribute that? Oh, yes. We've uh, flown on several meteor missions with our cameras, uh, just taking advantage of it. Peter Jennison uh, does it for his SETI program. But you, know, you can see the meteors come in and burn up and ablate. Uh, of course, with meteors, you can't, you just aim in the general direction. You expect to see them. But when you do it with uh, uh, spacecraft that uh, we know where they're going to be and where they're going to re enter, and we've done several re entry entries, and they're really exciting watching uh, the event. Uh, of late, I, can, can, have we got one we can show? Other questions? Just a question back, back here. Anyway, we have data available on some events, and uh, they show in good resolution the how the meters abl ablating. Does that help? Oh, good. That was a really great talk, Mike. Thanks for, for um, giving us the, the, all the information that you've gathered over the last four years. I have a couple of questions for you. One is um, a science question. Um, and it's, can you distinguish in your gravity waves, um, ways that are produced difference, uh, ways that are produced by flows across a land-sea interface versus an orographic feature like over a mountain? Uh, that's one question. The other question is um, more of a social one. It's, it's uh, kind of, uh, I need you to kind of fess up about your 40-year career. Um, and uh, of this list here of all these exotic places you've been to and the things that you've done, um, I noticed that it was the things you've done and the exotic places you've been to. And I'm wondering um, on what occasions that list, the order should have been reversed, where you thought of exotic places to go to and then things you could do by going there. I don't know how to answer that. <laughs> Maybe we should apologize every time we turn up that we're ready. <laughs> What was your first question again? I can you distinguish waves that are produced by mean flows across a land sea interface versus waves across uh, orographic? I think we should be able to do that if we get enough data to be able to compare it with the events that were generated differently. Uh, I'm not sure I mean, what different signature they would have. If it's just the way we distinguish between them is if you've got a, a source that's well known, so it's um, always in the same place. 
So that way you could attribute it to it with um, events which are stationary. Um, and you can do that too, because you have the, the characteristic for that as well. So I think you'd have to know what the characteristics are to say that must be a, a bore. But uh, when we look at them enough, um, we are able to distinguish between those. Uh, I think we have one? a question way at the back from Jim Hecht there. <laughs> oh, I didn't hear because everybody laughed. So, so the question was, what was your favorite place to work and what was your least favorite place to work? Oh, I can wax on that, all right. The favorite place to go? Hmm. Well, I want to say Hawaii or Brazil, Utah State. <laughs> Uh, what was the difficult question? The, the difficult question was, what was your least favourite? But that, that might be a bit of a, a trap. So. <laughs> Oops. That was meant to be positive. Yeah. Maybe you can leave that for the audience to speculate on. Yeah. Wyndham. Well, what happened to you then? So, sounds like a terrible place. Uh, any, uh, we have a question from Sharon. Yeah. Um, hi, Mike. Thank you very much for the um, the lovely talk. Um, I'm just wondering, out of everything that you've done, all the papers, everything that you've worked on, what is the thing that you're you're um, most proud of that you think you made the that that made the biggest um, impact for all of us? Well, that uh, strongly curved wave event sitting on top of a thunderstorm was such a, uh, a signature. That's, that's one we, I didn't realize it. I looked back amongst my papers and I discovered there was another one. I didn't even know we'd written it. So there's a, it was, so, some of the events are so rich. Uh, but yeah, that one, I, I think. But then there's the one on the G5 with all that energy and momentum. And is there a, if, a visit, if a student comes to visit and we used to stick things out on the wall, now we're more sophisticated. But um, we always use them to show visually. So it's, so it's the visual data which shows, even though the plots and their variations and the uh, other features of the thing, might be more important with all the numbers. It's whatever strikes their attention and gets them hooked. Well, thank you. I think we maybe have time for one more quick question if there is one. Oh, yes, the questions uh, from Slido. Uh, so the first question is, what are the global scale impacts of observing mesospheric temperature? What are they? I don't know. That's what we're here to find out. That's a, that's a great answer. We've got another question from Slido. What scales of gravity waves can be observed by the mesospheric temperature mapper camera? So what's, what wave scales can you resolve? Okay, it's made to make uh, measurements that, uh, uh, that will basically fit within the box, so to speak. Um, so we could see waves with periods of 20 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour, um, scale, horizontal scales, um, up to 200 kilometers, but, but probably less uh, will be used. But anything that, as I said, that sort of fits in the box with our resolution, and that's uh, dictated by the... Uh, in, in the end, the, the limited time that we'll have on the ISS with the two the two measurements, I mean, with the availability for two years. 
So, all right, well, 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 thank you, Mike. So I think um, before we let you go, uh, I think Larissa has uh, a certificate to present to you, so. Yes, one, uh, one, uh, uh, one more uh, moment, Mike. Uh, 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 thank you so much for fantastic lecture, but most of all, thank you for 40 plus years of uh, leading and inspiring this uh, entire community. And on behalf of uh, all of us, entire community and CEDA steering committee, let me, uh, let me present you. Uh -huh. you hold it. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm gonna My life is well, is it lunch early? Uh, well, well, thank you, Mike. That was fantastic. We enjoyed that. Good. All right, well, I think it's time to move on to our next two talks. And we're switching gears a little bit now. We're going to be talking about uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, activities associated with CEDAR. And our first talk will be presented online. Uh, the speaker is David Newman from the University of Alaska. Are, are you online, David? Can you hear us? I am, and I can. Can you hear me? Mark, can you, you hear me? David online, Andrew? Can you hear me? Hello? Can you hear me? I can hear you. We, we can't quite hear you yet, David. We're just having a little bit of, I, I see you, but I can't hear you. We have a little bit of uh, technical difficulty here. I will keep talking and then you can tell me when you can hear me. We have you now, David. Thank you. Oh, we had you. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm gonna also try sharing screen now, and you can tell me if you see that. Uh, we see your screen. So okay, perfect. Thank you for that. All right. Um, so let me offer some introduction. Uh, David Newman is a, I think now professor emeritus of physics from the University of Alaska, a colleague of mine. Uh, but more importantly for this. Uh, he has been the chair of the American Physical Society Division of Plasma Physics for four years and has worked for a long time on DEI activities associated with the American Physical Society. Um, I've heard David give lots of talks on this. Uh, it's something he's very committed to. Um, and we've invited him to speak here today to give a perspective on DEI from sort of the broader physics community just than CEDAR. So David will give us a 15 minute talk on that. Uh, and then Julio will give us a more specific talk on uh, activities here at CEDAR. But for now, I'll hand this over to David and he can tell us about the activities of the American Physical Society Division of Plasma Physics to address DEI, which is a, such an important topic for our community. Thank you, David. Thanks, Mark, very much. And, and if, if I cut out at any point, someone should yell at me. Um, so first, thank you very much for inviting me to give this presentation. I have never had the pleasure of actually attending a CDR meeting, and I regret that and hope to at some point. I also would like to criticize the organizers because after that fascinating and beautiful talk, this will be probably a letdown. So I apologize in advance. Um, so the, the the title in this has has some kind of rather obnoxious words and evidence-based approach. And there's a reason for those words. And the reason is that we're scientists and we often think that we can solve problems because we know how to look at problems. But the fact of the matter is that we're not experts in everything. 
and we often actually go the wrong direction. And so what we've been trying to do in the division of plasma physics is, and, and beyond, this is, this is actually much, much broader than just the division of plasma physics, um, is actually look for people who are subject matter experts and look for literature and actually look for research that's been done specifically in how to improve diversity and equity and inclusivity. And I'm gonna go really quickly because I could spend an hour talking about each of these and have in the past on each of these topics. So first, what's diversity? Um, and diversity writ large is just about anything that we use to identify ourselves and others. And that includes race, gender, ethnicity, this, this whole list of things, and this is not inclusive. It's important to note that some diversity in a particular, concept, in a particular context um, might be associated with a minority group, but it doesn't have to be associated with a minority group. It can um, be associated with an underrepresented group. And, and we're gonna talk about that a little bit in a moment. What's up, equity and inclusivity. This is what I was telling you. These are not beautiful slides. Um, so I'm not gonna read this to you because there are too many words and I don't have that much time. And so let me just read the first, the first sentence essentially. And that is equity is the guarantee of fair treatment, access, opportunity and advancement for all while striving to identify and eliminate barriers that have prevented the full participation of some groups. And there, there's a reference for these uh, at the bottom. Inclusion is authentically bringing traditionally excluded individuals and or groups into the processes, activities, and decision policy making in a way that shares the power and ensures equal access to opportunities and resources. So one is fair treatment, and another one is actually being welcoming. And that's a really important thing, that one without the other often doesn't work. So is this a problem? And so this is this is an old uh, figure. And the reason I'm using this, this um, 2017 figure is that the data, newer data actually exists on um, the uh, NSF website. However, they don't have this beautiful, or what I consider a beautiful plot. On the right-hand side of this is the US population breakdown by these different groups. Um, so that's the demographic breakdown. This is in the science and um, engineering occupations. And one of the things that's really important to notice is that so some of these are overrepresented compared to the population. Others are underrepresented compared to the overall population. And so these are not necessarily minority groups but they can be underrepresented. And so you can have an underrepresented group that's not a minority group. You can have a minority group that is actually overrepresented in science and engineering. Um, and, and so this taking a look at what the base group is and then what the representation from that base group is, is actually an important thing. And therefore actually gathering data for various areas is important. So why is it a problem that there are underrepresented groups? Or why is it a problem that, um, that, that there isn't diversity in some areas? And that is, so one can make the argument, and it often has been made, that it's a societal good. And, and I personally buy that argument. However, a more effective argument often with our community is this. And that is, we're losing a large fraction of our best minds, our best ideas, approaches, dynamics, because diversity in background also leads to diversity in ideas. And it's diversity in ideas that we very, very much need. We're all familiar with the problem that occurs when people are simply thinking the same way that everyone else in their group is thinking. And that is actually a problem that is to some degree, to a large degree, actually mitigated by having diversity of people and therefore diversity of ideas and approaches. Um, so pro problem solving is definitely aided. And, and, and when I say definitely, this is based on a huge amount of evidence that published evidence that now exists in this area. So there's three issues, at least, and those are in training, retaining, and promoting people. And so we need to be welcoming enough to get people into an area. 
we need then to be supportive enough uh, to retain the people. And we have to also make sure that those people get promoted through the system so that there isn't a glass ceiling of some kind that, that lets people in to the, the, the room, but does not let them uh, attain leadership positions. Um, so what have we been doing? Uh, in the APS, I'm going to come to another slide that's even more crowded than this one. This is just a beginning. And that is we've formed advocacy and support groups and committees. For example, Women in Plasma Physics a few decades ago. And now W Plus, um, in order, they, they, the Women in Plasma Physics has tried to become more inclusive. And it became the W Plus uh, committee. And they have speakers, ally training, stories. Um, DEI, Organizing Collective Committee. That's the one that the whatever seven people on the first page um, are from. And that, that's a committee that we started about five years ago um, while I was actually in the in the uh, chair cycle of Division of Plasma Physics. Um, and that's what I'm gonna talk largely about what we've been doing. Um, uh, about three years ago, we started an LGBTQ plus committee. Um, there, a BIPOC committee was started a few years ago and very importantly, data collection. And so that's a difficult thing. We also are working on a code of conduct uh, and town hall meetings and evidence-based practices. And I, I'll use this, this, this abbreviation a couple more times, SMEs. So those are subject matter experts. And what we have tried to do is we've tried to actually um, entrain subject matter experts, not necessarily, in fact, necessarily not plasma physicists, but people who are actual social scientists and study this to actually give us training and advice on what are the best approaches to, to improving our, our DEI world. Um, so, you know, I gave, I gave, when I was the chair of the division of plasma physics, I would give a morning, a morning little spiel about how important this was at the beginning of each of our plenary sessions. And I had people coming up to me, calling me the word police and much worse things actually. Um, but it turns out words matter a lot and words matter both to change the culture and also to make people feel more included. And so when we're talking about these things, it does matter the words you choose to use. And so things, that seem to majority communities to be very simple and unimportant, often like personal pronouns, are actually very important to underrepresented or oppressed communities. And therefore, these things matter a lot. And stories are important. Listening is important. And so, so this is something that is easy to say, not necessarily easy to do, but in order to change a culture of a community, one has to actually think about what you're saying and how you're saying it. Making mistakes is fine. Trying to improve is what's necessary. So the APS membership, um, to put it bluntly, well, so U.S. population, this is, this is one specific aspect of the diversity question. The U.S. population uh, has a majority of female <laughs> members. Um, and so therefore, therefore this 50.2% versus 49.8% um, would suggest that there should be, at the very least, equality between the two. And yet, if you take a look at, so this is this is the membership statistics for the different divisions in the American Physical Society. Uh, Division of Plasma Physics is this one down here, is one of the worst. Um, and so this is our demographic. Uh, th this was our demographic breakdown a couple of years ago. It's gotten a tiny bit better over the last few years. Um, so 90-10. The reason I'm actually showing this year's is because this was the last year that I could find the statistics for the fellows. And so uh, to become a fellow of the American Physical Society, you have to be nominated and go through this, this um, nomination process and election process. And in the Division of Plasma Physics, it's even worse than the membership in the Division of Plasma Physics. And so it's about 95-5. So this is a problem, obviously. 
Um, and, and this is one that we're trying to figure out how we address. Um, I'm going to skip past these two uh, because I want to get to the solutions. And so problems. It, a lot of these problems are cultural. Um, and by cultural, I mean cultural within the STEM world and particularly within the plasma physics community. Um, so there's a lot of sexist, racist, otherist, be homophobic, everything, behavior. There are biases, implicit or overt biases that exist. And this um, QRC code actually takes you to, for those of you who haven't looked at it, the implicit bias tests, which I encourage people to take to learn about yourself. Nobody is going to know about your answers and doesn't get scored. Um, old boys club, expectations, cultural differences. So bibliometric um, differences are partially cultural. Um, what do we value? Team versus prima donnas. Um, entitlement. And this starts early on. And I would tell you some stories about that, but I don't have time, so I'm not going to right now. So what are the solutions? Um, and and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come in a second to what we're really working on a lot of. But these are things that we have been trying for some time, and that is helping to facilitate role models, mentoring, affinity groups, workshops, um, guidelines, and access. So, for example, in meetings now, we give everybody the opportunity to put their personal pronouns on, on their um, name tags and things like that. Helping with child care, enforcing rules of behavior. Quotas generally considered not to be a good thing. How do we change the culture and who should do it? So one of the problems often is that you need fairly senior people to help facilitate the change because it, um, it, it's not fair to have the underrepresented and oppressed groups doing the change themselves. And therefore it has to be a cultural change that occurs at all levels at the same time. So this is the this is actually even though I have one minute left this is actually the main slide and that is this these are the ongoing division of plasma physics actions so we have tried to initiate community training for both the leadership of the community and this goes outside of the uh, American Physical Society community we have initiated this training for the Department of Energy um for groups within NSF and um these we bring SMEs on board, and this is not necessarily cheap, but the Division of Plasma Physics is actually paying for these subject matter experts to come and do the training. Psychological safety training. I consider that one of the best trainings I have ever attended, actually. Um, the research shows that, uh, and, and if you want, you can Google um, Project Aristotle, and this is, that comes from Google. <laughs> you can Google what Google did. Um, and their research was trying to find out what makes most effective working groups. And it turns out psychological safety is the number one thing. Ally training um, has been very important to make people feel safer in, in the, with, within the division of plasma physics at conferences, et cetera. Undoing racism training workshops have been very, have been painful for many people, but have also been extremely valuable, I believe. We've had facilitator training, um, and then we've had training for our award and talk committees in or before they do the selections in order to try and to kind of try to broaden um, their understanding of their own biases and also broaden the metrics that are used. We've had workshops on evidence-based hiring and admissions, and that's bias training, non-cognitive metrics, which are called holistic uh, review. Um, and what how we can behave as good, valuable gatekeepers. Um, we have developed site metrics for meetings so that we can we can say, no, we are not going to go to this place because this is not a safe place for our meeting for for our participants. We just um canceled a meeting in Memphis because our community felt that a, a meeting that was not this year, but the following year, because the community felt that it no longer was safe for our members. And so we've developed, we've developed rigid metrics that say, no, we don't go to a place that scores below a certain score. We're developing a human relations code and a bias incident policy where we're trying to utilize restorative or transformative justice. And then, as I mentioned already, um, agency outreach and interventions. 
So I'm going to, this is just a slide on our site selection. This is the last slide I'm gonna put up right now because I'm out of time. So culture is really hard to change and it won't change overnight. And we have to recognize that. Um, we need to educate our community. We need to do research and we need to be persistent and we can do this. And so what we're trying to do is go from where we are, which is over here to here where everyone is invited to the table. All right, thank you very much. And I probably don't have time for questions, but. So thank you, David. That was a, a really nice uh, talk on the subject. And every time I look at this topic, I always see statistics that shock me, but I think your 95 five uh, breakdown of uh, fellows was one of the most striking statistics I've seen. I think we have time maybe for one quick question, if there is one. Yep, one question over here. Uh, good morning. This is Diana Lauchs from the United States Military Academy. Um, I was wondering if you could talk to the community about APS's Conference for Undergraduate Women in Physics. So, um, so, so I, I can tell you a little bit about it, and that is there is, I think it's every other year that there is a meeting that is run for undergraduate women in physics, um, and it is held, actually there are multiple conferences, I believe, that are held, and um, uh, so my students who have gone to it in the past have felt that it was an extremely valuable um, experience both because of the issue of role models, finding role models and meeting role models, but also for networking in a safe environment. Um, I'm not sure if I'm not sure if if what I'm saying is directly addressing what you would like me to say. Um, thank you. Actually, I'll just let the group know. So January 19th to 21st, 2024 is it APS.org slash QWIP. And yep. you can actually see all those 14 sites across the nation that are hosting Thank roughly 100 to 150 students each site. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank, thank you for that. And thank you again, David. That was uh, terrific. I think it's time to move on. So we, perhaps we could thank David one more time. So we have one more talk this morning and then I have a couple of announcements after that. So please stay for the announcements. But our uh, final talk for this session is from Julio Urbina and he will be talking to us about uh, DEI activities specifically here in CEDAR. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone. So while we're loading the presentation, uh, maybe I'll, I can use this time to give some background. Uh, first of all, thank you for staying here, for uh, staying to listen to this talk, and it means that you care about these issues. Um, and we have a lot of work to do. Uh, by no means, I'm just representing the voice of a team. Uh, I want to uh, acknowledge that when the pandemic happened back in 2020, uh, 2020 we did a virtual uh, CEDAR. And there was a session uh, on DEI issues at CEDAR. And that's how we started uh, these activities. And here we have, uh, <laughs> you know, Thank you. All right, so let's see if this works. Okay, perfect, thank you. All right, so uh, here we have a quick summary of the history, but also I want to link to uh, the speaker, right? Uh, we have many speakers when we have this uh, first DEI workshop at CEDA, it was virtual, as I said. Uh, we have several speakers who brought these uh, DEI issues and we added, uh, in addition to DEI, the belonging part. So the previous talk gave, gave us a good back, background on to the topics, what DEI means, uh, and also uh, some, some solutions, right? We have a lot of work to do, as I said, but also I want to put a, a very important note, right? Because I myself, I, am, I wasn't born in the US, I was born in Peru, and I myself come from a marginalized group in Peru, 
So the issues that we talk about in the US do not translate linearly to issues to other, to other countries, right? So we have to be careful and mindful about that. And of course, there are the cultural issues and things that, that, that we, have to, we have to do. So usually what I've noticed after living in the US for such a long time, and by the way, I was also, my first experience was a CDAR meeting back in 93, and it was an amazing experience. I, I felt welcome uh, and I, I want to also thank Mike Taylor because I was a student uh, when he gave one of the tutorials and it was amazing to learn about physics and things. But then moving forward, right? We're here and we are talking about these issues that when I think back, you know, they were there also, right? So this is the team. We created the DEI task force. Um, we have Mac Jones, Katrina Bolser, and I, I have to read the name because I spent time preparing the things that we're going to show you. Hamako Mari, Phil Erickson, Hugh Jun Liu, uh, Angeline Burrell, uh, Andrew Pepper, Kaylin Greer, Gia Yu, uh, Matthew Sedergan, Lindsay Goodwin. Lindsay, you're there. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Megan Limay, Susan Nossel, um, and myself and Mac, Mac Jones. Uh, special thanks to Mac who prepared the presentation and also uh, kudos to Astrid Maut for the figures that we're going to show here to the statistics about that that she prepared. And uh, let me see here. So what are the goals, right? So what are the goals of the DEI task force? So we want to assess and formalize DEI efforts at CEDAR. Uh, we want to establish and normalize the EI presence in the CEDAR community, and of course, foster uh, improvement in CEDAR through implementation of actionable, actionable items, right? And one of the things that we talk about was, and this is also, you know, a concern, right? When we, when things happen, we talk about it, and then things dissipate, right? You just, you talk about it, and then nothing happens, right? And one of the things I have learned, and also this is advice for those who are very young, who are students, that as a student, you have more power than what you think. And you have to be involved and you have to care about this. Why? Because right now, decisions are made, policy decisions are made that will affect your future. And when we're students, sometimes we don't care where we're thinking of our thesis, our research, right? Which I understand that, but we also have to make a space and we have to care about these issues, right? Because policy is important. Right, and so what we're trying to do with this, we're talking about here is we hope that we have some action items and you know improve this this domain. So with that, let me see if I can. Oops. Okay, so here are some of the uh, activities that we've been doing this year at CEDAR. Some of the like, for example, building a safe space, continuing a dialogue, anti-resistant literacy accessible spaces for scientists with disabilities, student and early career opportunities, supporting women and minorities, anti-resistant literacy. And we have been seeing these in the slides here that are rotating in the plenary. So, and some of these issues have been also uh, discussed in these uh, activities uh, that we have this week uh, at CEDAR. And let's see here. And if you're interested in, in joining in these efforts, please let uh, uh, Mark, me, or Lindsay let us know, you know, uh, about uh, how to join these efforts. And we can move to the next slide. This needs some work. Okay. So where we've been, what have been doing? So we, as I said, the members of the the task force across different fields in ironomy and space physics. Here are some of the highlights, right? So we have these uh, monthly uh, community tag tag acts. We used to call them happy hours, but we, we were, there was a suggestion to change the name, right? Because we talk about you know sensitive topics. We have uh, uh, the equitable letters for space fixes, how to write good uh, recommendation letters. And uh, there is also particip there has been participation in the membership of the Decadal Survey for Solar and Space Physics and the State of the Professional Panel a number of presentations at different uh, uh, yeah, workshops, activities like AGU, EGU, NASM, and so on. Uh, and also articles, journal articles that have been written about 
uh, and responses to DEI efforts and also position uh, the dedicated survey position on the state of the, of the, of the field. A uh, couple of articles to mention, they were, uh, there's an article by Burrell uh, in 2023 and, and also Jones and Mout in 2022. And some of the figures we're going to show are from the article from Jones and Mout 2022. Uh, can we go to the next one, please? Uh, the other way around. Okay, so ways to get involved at CEDAR, right? So here we have a number of, you know, things that we can do. So there is this link that we, we have assigned uh, the CEDAR DAS statement and call for action. There's the link there. We will provide this information so you can have them. Um, we also have, we will request an input, right? For uh, CEDAR DEI actions items. Um, post on the CEDAR DEI Slack also. <laughs> I participate in this uh, DEI community tax. I volunteer to review uh, you know, those in the CDR community, recommendation, nomination letters, uh, and so on. Uh, and there is also a link for uh, call to action for anti-racist science community and the geoscientists of color. There's a link there. And if you know, please sign and continue with suggestions. And of course, contact uh, any members of the CDR DEI task force you know, in, in joining us. And of course, if you have any questions or anything, um, if you want us to listen to you, we'll be here happy to, to listen to, to you. Okay, so in uh, uh, feedback, right, that we uh, collected out of these uh, workshops, uh, there was uh, a list of suggesting items, achievable items that we can do, right? And one of the important and true priority actions was to collect demographic information at CEDAR, right? I'm going to show, as I said, are from the article that Jones, uh, Mac Jones and Astrid Maud published and shows the demographics in, in our community, specifically for CEDAR. So, and why do we want to do this, right? Because <clears throat> this is always the question, why, why, why do we care about this? So, and what I have learned is, another thing that I have learned is that, if the National, National Academy of Sciences or the National Academy of Engineering say it, then it is important. Uh, otherwise, it doesn't become important. So, well, they have these reports, right, that tell us, right, that without data, right, without data, scientific organizations, policy makers, programs and stakeholders have, have difficulty implementing structural interventions that could be catalyze change. And uh, so demonstrating progress requires data. And here we have some, uh, as I said, important articles that have been published, you know, from the academies with regard to this, to this issue. <laughs> so there is one from the Academy, National Academy of Science, where there is currently no strategy, right? No strategy and a methodology being employed to effectively gather demographic data on participation uh, in the earth and space sciences along career you know, pathway from undergrad, grad students to academic departments and professional workforce. And more specifically specifically for us, you know, we have the uh, the, Keda, the midterm, right? Mikeda Solver in the uh, solar and space fixes, right? That says that NASA, NSF, NOAA should develop a strategic plans for the Heliophysics community with goals and methods to improve the diversity, race, gender, uh, age, country of origin. So the next decade of service should include state of the profession similar to the Astro 2020 decade of survey. The state of the profession panel should have advanced the demographics and diversities uh, and data demonstrated. So that's what we care about this and that's what we want to collect uh, information uh, for participants in the CDAR. In, in the CEDAR you know, community, right? So here is the methodology, right? The, how we collected demographic information. And we're going to show for two years, uh, 2021 and 2022, right? And I, I guess I need to hurry up a little bit. Uh, so here's the methodology. We're going to provide this slide so you we can carefully study, examine. And one important thing is that the demographic information that we requested, it was voluntary, right? All the participants, and the 
some of the terms from 2022 are not identical to the ones from 2021 because there was feedback on race, ethnicity, and how we define those things. So here are the statistics quickly. So we are scientists, we like data. So as I said, we're going to pause this slide so you can carefully study this data. I think they are very telling uh, important things, right? So in uh, the previous, uh, um, you know, 2021 was virtual, right? We have over 800 participants. And, and last year we have about 322, you know, participants in sort of a hybrid mode. Career distribution is very similar, consistent between 21 and 22. Um, and there is a ratio of two to one male to female participants. And one important thing that I want to point out on the distribution on the vertical, uh, on the vert on the horizontal on figure C, right? On year, there is a student 2021, student 22, there is early career 21 early career 22, there is one important thing that you can see, right? Early career partic participants in uh, 2021 20, drops from 45 to 17% in 2022, right? Um, and then, let me see here, then there is another distribution here with regards to race and ethnicity. And ethnicity. We're showing uh, 2021 because the data from 2022 is very similar. And important things from this figure is that those identifying as white and, uh, or Asian and Middle Eastern representing about 90% of the CDA participants. And all other races underrepresented defined by the National Academy represents about nine to 12% in, in our CDA participants. And in general, early careers and student and early career uh, CDA registrants tend to be slightly more diverse than mid and senior career. As you can see here on the distribution, right? For seniors, about 70, 73% to 25%. So <laughs> as I said, I mean, there is a lot of information that can be studied from these two figures. And of course, encourage you to read the paper uh, from 2022 uh, that links to this data. And here we have one more time, right? Ways of how to get involved uh, in, in making this happen, how to uh, help us improve, right? We're a team, want to join the DI task force, you know, and also, uh, uh, you know, uh, create safe spaces for, for each of us. So, with that, I think I, I conclude that, unless I forgot anything, Lindsay, right? More, more, more or less. Thank you very much. Thank you, Julio, and uh, sorry for hurrying you up. I think this is really important. I, I probably shouldn't have done that. Uh, we have time for one or two questions. One here. Um, hi, Julio, Romina Nikukar from APL. Um, it's great to see um, how far we have come along as a community and all of these great things that um, are going on in the, in the community is all great. Uh, collecting demogra demographic information is absolutely essential to do this. So um, um, I commend the organizing um, the task force for, for doing that. Um, I just want to add that um, we should not stop there. Uh, in order to change the culture, we need to get a better information on how the general culture is, how many people are subject to harassment, bullying, the work-life ba uh, work balance issues that most of us are dealing with, imposter syndromes. Uh, I think these are um, all the things that needs, we need to know where we are as a community and then uh, devise ways you know, um, to address them. Uh, so it is very important to not to stop at the demographic level, but run surveys, professionally led surveys um, to, to know where we are. I just wanted to mention that. Thank you. Thank you, Romina. So yes, this is the first out of a list of, you know, action, action writing. We'll continue, of course, doing more things. Thank you, Romina. I think there was one over there, this one over there. On the left.
Hi, uh, thanks. This is Caitlin Greer from LASP at the University of Colorado. I uh, One of the things that's come to my attention over this meeting has been um, the number of people with small children here. And I'm wondering if there are any demographic information collected on the number of participants that have small children, because that uh, is both a challenge and also feeds into some of our other demographic challenges. Thank you. I, Lindsay, can you help me out to answer that question that we have? <laughs> okay. I'm this next question that was coming up. Um, I'm asking about the demographics of uh, CDAR participants with small children uh, uh, because those are special challenges. Um, yeah, we, we don't know what those are. Um, it'd be good to get like those, that kind of information. <clears throat> Sorry. Is this better? No, it's not. Um, so I'm trying. There we go. All right. Um, yeah. So uh, yesterday at the women's breakfast, we had a really good discussion about like dependency care um, and like the kind of things that like Katie and I were realizing is that like there's a whole bunch of issues that affect people with like children that like I don't I don't have children, so I don't know what these issues are. Um, and so gaining those demographics and just hearing those sort of feedback will be great. And so one thing that Katie brought up that like I would love and think the task force should like get involved with is even just having an event for like parents or people who have dependents uh, just so we can like field those comments. Does that answer kind of what you're saying? Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think there is a question on the Okay, okay, we'll wrap it up. Okay, so there's a question on the slide also. Can you ask, can you speak the difference between population and community? Uh, I am an example, a member of an, an ACE population, but not the ACE community. Uh, so I don't know. <laughs> um, so I don't, um, I think I know where you're coming from. Um, so like identifying as someone from the LGBTQ community plus, like I would say I'm part of that population, but I'm not necessarily part of that community. Like in that, like I, I like would identify as such, but like maybe I'm not like involved in like certain dialogues that go within that community. Um, that's, I don't know. I think that's maybe like the perspective that this person is coming from that they would identify as part of like the ACE population. I'm assuming they mean the asexual population, but not necessarily, or sorry, um, I, maybe they're not specifically identifying as that. I should clarify that. So they would be part of that population, but not necessarily part of that community and like a part of those dialogues and cultures that are involved in that. But maybe I'm wrong about that. So I apologize to whoever answered that question if I completely am not answering your question. Thank you. Who wants it? Well, thank you so much, Julio. Thank you, Lindsay, for that. And I would just add a note, standing here on the stage, looking out at, at the audience, you, you can just tell that people are paying attention to this. You're just looking at your faces, that everybody is listening and, and taking this seriously and feeling that this is important. So I find that encouraging. Uh, all right, I think that concludes our um, presentations for the morning. I do have two announcements. Uh, one is, I think uh, there is an error in the agenda uh, there's a student lunch with CPAS and there's a CDAR Science Steering Committee lunch at lunchtime. And I think the venues for those two locations have been transposed in the agenda. So the, I think the CSSC lunch is in the Embarcadero room and the student lunch with CPAS is in the pothole room. Uh, and we encourage all of